Welcome back. You didn't find all 42 things that had changed in this room, did you? So we finished the two overview chapters and now we're moving on to uh, the section on processes which is probably the core section of the entire textbook. We'll be here for five chapters. Here's today's topics, the two uh, topics on process scheduling and operations on processes will be done at an overview level. Later on we'll look uh, at CPU scheduling algorithms and uh, your, your projects will familiarize you with actual operations on processes. Here are the chapter objectives. We'll um, almost ignore jobs. Uh, we'll be focusing, we pretty much focus on um, time sharing systems. So as you can see, uh, the uh, well, note that the textbook uses process and job interchangeably uh, in Linux uh, processes and threads are referred to as tasks. Uh, a process, remember, is a program in execution. Uh, the, these parts the text section or text segment, uh, stack segment, data segment, heap, those are the memory resources required by any process. The, the, uh, the code is uh, stored in the text segment. The stack you'll remember from uh, CS220 is used for activation frames, uh, global variables that are known at compile time and uh, static data are uh, stored in the data segment and then dynamically allocated uh, variables and data are, are maintained in the heap. Also note that uh, the notion of a process includes the program counter and other CPU registers. Nothing new here. This is a simple process memory model. Note that the stack grows down in memory, as you saw from CS220. The heap grows toward it. Uh, this figure implies that the four segments are in contiguous memory. Uh, we'll see when we study memory management that um, that's not necessarily the case. Neither is it the case that the data within a particular segment is all in contiguous memory. We associate states with processes while a process is being created. It's in a new state. From there, it will typically uh, enter the ready state along with other ready processes. Uh, these are processes that are ready to go but aren't currently executing. When a process uh, does become runnable, when the operating system selects it to run, it uh, it, it its state changes to the running state. Uh, a running process can go back to the ready state when the uh, when the operating system selects another process to run. Uh, let's assume for the moment that we only have one CPU. If a process uh, performs an I/O operation, it will enter a, a waiting state. Right, it needs to wait for that I/O operation to complete before it's eligible uh, to run again, at which point it would enter the, uh, the ready state or perhaps go directly to the running state. And then as the operating system is cleaning up after a process that has exited, the process is in the terminated state. So here's a graph that depicts the process states and the transitions between them. All of the information related to a process is kept in an operating system data structure called the process control block or PCB. Uh, looking at the figure on the right we see the process state uh, and process number uh, in Linux it's called the PID is an integer uh, identifier for a process. Uh, the processes registers are stored in the PCB. They have to be put somewhere when the process isn't running. Um, and then we see that the resources allocated to a process, such as uh, the memory segments, uh, open files, other devices that the process uh, may be using, are also uh, kept track of in the PCB. 
This switch is commonly referred to as a context switch. So here on the left, process P0 is running, and then some event occurs that would cause it to, to either wait, or uh, perhaps it used up its entire uh, CPU quantum, and uh, it's time for another process to run for a while. So the context switch starts with saving uh, P0's state into its piece into the PCB uh, specifically uh, the 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 state uh, would be the CPU register values. Uh, this is all done in kernel mode. Uh, other bookkeeping might get done, uh, and then the uh, the CPU scheduler will select a ready process from the ready queue and load its registers into the CPU, and then beginning. Uh, to execute or re-execute that process, so that uh, that takes place here. So uh, at this stage, we've completed the context switch, and process P1 is now running. Note that um, during this time period, that's when the context switch is occurring. Uh, this is overhead, which we uh, prefer to avoid because we're not running user code uh, during the context switch. We'll uh, skip discussing threads for now. We'll get into them in the next chapter. In Linux, a PCB uh, variable is called a, a task struct. As you can see here, this is an extremely simple representation uh, of the task strut. Uh, the actual task strut declaration for the uh, Linux kernel that we're uh, working with in this class is 278 lines long. Right? So there's a lot of information that has to be uh, tracked for, for a process. The figure at the uh, bottom of the slide uh, implies that uh, these task struts are maintained in a linked list. The process scheduler, also known as the CPU scheduler, is responsible for maintaining these lists of PCBs. Here you can see an illustration of that. The ready queue is a list of, of the PCBs of all processes that are in the ready state. Then we have a, a number of lists, one per device. Um, you can see that no process is waiting on a, on a magnetic tape. We have three processes that are waiting on a disk unit. So note that although there is one, in a sense, wait state for a process. Um, there are multiple wait queues, one per device upon which a process may be waiting. And uh, at the bottom you can see uh, a single uh, wait list for, for a terminal. Here's another way of looking at the situation. We have process queues, we have events, and we have um, system resources. There are uh, typically three types of schedulers uh, possible within an operating system, short term, long term, and medium term. The uh, short term scheduler is the one that runs most often. I generally call it the CPU scheduler. Uh, it needs to be efficient. It's responsible for selecting which process uh, is assigned the CPU next. The long term scheduler, uh, this is at the the highest level, it runs the least frequently. It's responsible for maintaining a good degree of multiprogramming, uh, which is a way of saying uh, keeping the CPU busy at all times. Um, it's going to try to characterize incoming processes as I.O. bound, which means they'll be doing a lot of waiting, and CPU bound processes, which means that they'll be um, using long CPU bursts and typically they will uh, uh, use up their quantums uh, completely and uh, be interrupted uh, through a timer mechanism uh, in order to um, in order for context switches from them. So as mentioned here the long-term scheduler is striving for a good process mix um, to keep the CPU busy as much as possible. Sometimes the long-term scheduler gets it wrong and puts uh, 
too many processes into the mix, uh, at which point uh, processes may be starving for resources, particularly memory. Uh, when that situation occurs, and the term for that is thrashing, the medium term scheduler is called into play. It will um, select among the processes in memory, select some to be suspended and paged out of memory, uh, freeing up memory to be reallocated to the remaining processes. Uh, coming back to long-term scheduling for, for a moment, um, I tend to think of the cron facility in Linux as a long-term scheduler, although cron doesn't really distinguish between types or processes, meaning uh, CPU bound or I.O. bound. So the situation is different for mobile systems. In a certain sense, you don't necessarily want um, a lot of background processes running because uh, they could be consuming um, power uh, and, and the operating system doesn't necessarily know that the user is going to return to them. Uh, an idle CPU is a nice thing uh, in a certain sense with mobile systems because if the CPU is idle, then uh, everything can be put into a, a low power state. Uh, in a traditional operating system, um, if the foreground process isn't doing much of anything, then context switches can occur to the to these background processes. But this again emphasizes that a context switch is overhead. Uh, from a user perspective, the system is not doing any useful work. Some additional process operations include uh, changing the priority of a process. Uh, in Linux, this is accomplished via the, the nice system call. Uh, we'll have uh, synchronization mechanisms for processes and communication mechanisms for processes. So in Linux, there is a system call known as fork. Stop your snickering right now, uh, by which one process creates another process. So the creating process is called the parent. The uh, created process is called the child. Um, the uh, fork system call returns uh, to the parent the child's PID. Uh, the child process uh, is returned a zero. Uh, that's how the two processes can figure out which is which. Uh, often the child process will execute another program. Um, this is done via a family of system calls in Linux called exec. And uh, those various exec sys calls allow these various sharing options that you can see in this slide. And then um, in terms of whether the parent waits for the child, consecutive execution, or continues to execute concurrently, uh, there's a system call called wait that the parent can use in order to wait for the child to complete its execution. This shows an abbreviated uh, Linux process tree. The uh, init process is created while the kernel is booting. It's the ancestor of all other processes. Uh, looking at the left subtree, a login process is created for each physical terminal attached to a system. Uh, this login process uh, authenticates a user, taking their uh, username and password. And if uh, the user is authenticated, then the login process will look in the password file to determine what shell to run for the user. In this case, uh, Bash is running, and then uh, the user can begin to interact with the system. And you can see in this example, uh, the user is running PS uh, to list the, the running processes and Emacs. Um, remote logins can be handled by uh, the SSH server. Um, here, the server, the main server that listens for the for the remote login requests, is PID 3028, and then a separate uh, SSH server is started to handle each uh, user's remote login. So again, SSH will perform authentication, taking 
uh, username and password and if everything checks out uh, the user's shell is run in this case TCSH so um, there's one login process per physical terminal and if uh, let's say 10 users have SSH into the system there will be uh, 11 SSH daemons running right one for each user and then finally the main uh, server SSH daemon that's listening for additional incoming uh, remote logins so this illustrates fork so the parent process is running it hits the fork syscall uh, that results in the creation of a child process uh, so fork returns from the parent process and also from the child process uh, so we say that fork returns twice in this example the parent then goes on to execute await so it's suspended the child executes the exec to run another program the program runs at the end of it in this example the child exits uh, we'll see uh, in an upcoming slide that uh, exit allows an integer value to be returned through the wait and then at that point the parent resumes execution so here's what process uh, creation looks like in Linux so the parent runs hits the syscall which returns twice once in the parent and once in the child both of them are at this point running the same code and note that the fork returns a PID value or the PID of the child to the parent and a PID of zero for the child unless there were a problem and the child process couldn't be created in which case the PID value returned is less than zero that's this case the else if right that uh, condition will be true for the child and so in this example the child executes the ls uh, command and then finally the else is the code executed by the parent process which you can see uh, the parent will wait for the child to complete uh, because it's made use of the wait system call this illustrates process creation in windows uh, i'm going to skip this so as i mentioned uh, earlier the exit system call takes an int parameter the uh, wait system call takes pointer to int so uh, when a child exits it can return an integer status that status value is kept in the child's PCB and then when the uh, parent resumes execution uh, that value will be pulled from the child's PCB and passed to the parent if the parent process doesn't execute the wait system call then uh, the parent process can make use of the abort system call to uh, to control the child process it's been my experience in Linux that uh, if a parent process terminates the uh, child process can continue It'd be easy enough to uh, write a small program to to test that remember that uh, the exit parameter um, passed from uh, passed to the exit system call from the child results in that status being stored in the child's PCB well what happens if the parent doesn't execute wait in order to retrieve that the operating system doesn't know if the child the parent will never execute wait or is just waiting for a while uh, to execute wait uh, to to um, pick up that value. So we have a situation where the child process has finished execution and in one sense doesn't need its resources anymore but the, uh, the PCB has to be kept uh, just in case the parent process does eventually execute wait. Um, that's you know sort of the definition of what a what a zombie is and that PCB a child's PCB has to be kept around either until the parent 
execute wait or terminate uh, on its own. This uh, illustrates some of the uh, reasons, the advantages of structuring a program as a number of independent processes, uh, specifically in this case if uh, Assuming that we have one process per, per tab in the browser, if one tab crashes, the other tabs will keep running, and hence the browser will keep running uh, in a browser uh, implemented as a single process. If one tab crashes, the entire browser is going to crash. Wow, that was a lot of processing for today. Get it? Processing?